Okay, so we have this idea of atomic high school. Um, but as I've said in class, that's just an analogy. It's just a way of understanding how to write electron configurations. And so what we're going to do uh, right now is talk about how to write electron configurations. That's the goal. It's based on the model of the high school, though. So if you remember, we have all of these different floors. We have on each floor, we have the classrooms. In the classrooms, we have desks. And the students sit in the desks. And the floors are very strange. They've got these ramps. That means that at various times, we're going to have what's called crossover, which means that, for example, room 4S is actually lower than room 3D. It's closer to the ground than room 3D, even though it's on the fourth floor. And we see the same sorts of things happening with 5S lower than 4D. We see 6S, which is actually not only lower than 5D, it's also lower than 4F. And so as we're filling students into these rooms, we're starting at the lowest room closest to the ground and we're going up to the next one and so on and so forth. Okay, So we've done that with students. All we really need to do now is change our terminology. We just need to change the words that we're using. So for example, instead of floor, we're now going to call that principal energy level or sometimes just energy level. Instead of the word classroom, we're going to use the word sublevel. Instead of the word desk, we're now going to use the phrase atomic orbitals. And then finally, our students are the electrons in an atom. So we need to sort of rethink our model slightly by just replacing some of these words. So again, we have the first energy level, the second energy level, the third energy level, the fourth energy level, and so on. In each energy level, there are one or more sublevels. So on the first energy level, there's just sublevel called 1s. And on the second energy level, there's 2s and 2p. And on the third energy level, there's 3s, 3p, and 3d. On the fourth energy level, 4s, 4p, 4d, and 4f. And then fifth, sixth, and seventh energy levels have the same number of sublevels and kinds of sublevels as the fourth energy level. So in each of those sublevels are a number of atomic orbitals. In a 1s sublevel, there's one atomic orbital. There are three atomic orbitals in a p sublevel, so 2p, 3p, 4p. There are five atomic orbitals in the d sublevels, and there are seven atomic orbitals in the f sublevels. And the electrons, the students, go and fit into those orbitals. So this concept of atomic orbitals, I want to talk a little bit about that. This is where the electrons actually go. This is where the students sit. They sit in desks. And remember how those desks were a little odd? Well, the atomic orbitals are the locations where we're going to find the electrons. Now, the first thing you need to understand is that electrons don't travel around the nucleus in orbits like Bohr thought. They're not like planets around the sun. They actually exist in what look like clouds. If you could see them, they'd look like a cloud. The cloud is an area where the electron of a particular energy is likely to be found. Remember that uh, where those sublevels are, where those energy levels are, where those orbitals are is dependent on the energy that an electron has. The, the most important thing, and write this down if you haven't, is that the more energy an electron has, the further away from the nucleus it's going to be. But the amount of energy that an electron has also determines what kind of orbital it's going to be in, what kind of cloud it's going to be in. How do we know this? Well, a guy by the name of Erwin Schrödinger figured all of this out, and he had a fairly very uh, complex equation mathematically uh, to determine where these electrons are likely to be found. Now it's a probability. Most of the time you're going to find them in these clouds. And the cloud represents a neighborhood where the electron can be. The shape of the cloud comes from solving the wave equation for a number of different values about the electron, including energy, and then graphing that. So you know that if you graph a linear equation, you get a straight line. If you graph a quadratic equation, you get a parabola. The more complex the equation, the more complex the graph looks. Well, Schrodinger's equation is very, very, very strange. It's very complex. And when you graph the solution set of that equation for a particular energy level or for a particular electron's energy, you get a three-dimensional shape. And that shape is what the cloud looks like. So it's all based on the energy of the electrons. And the shape of the clouds change. The more complex 
the sublevel, for example, the more complex the orbital shapes. Let me show you what I mean by that. These are the four different types of orbitals that we've learned about. We have at the top s orbitals. s orbitals are spherical. That's a simple shape because s orbitals, there's only one of them. In any sublevel that has s in its name, there's only one orbital. And since there's only one, that's pretty simple. So the electron's energy and the electron's location is going to be very simple, spherical. The next line, the yellow ones, those are the p orbitals. And when you have a p sublevel, you've got three of those atomic orbitals. They're all three in the same sublevel. As a matter of fact, they all share the same set of axes. And one is along the x-axis, the first one. Uh, one is along the y-axis, and one is along the z-axis. And they share the central point, the origin. So they're sort of all overlapped on each other. Um, three p orbitals, so the shape is a little bit more complex. The next row, the blue ones, those are the d orbitals. And you can see we're getting even more complex. These have uh, four little areas, four little clouds, except for the middle one, uh, where we can find electrons. And then below, you see how complex the f orbitals get. First of all, I would say, make sure you know the s and p orbitals. You know their shapes. Okay? But just in general, you want to understand that the more orbitals there are in a sublevel, the more complex those orbitals will have to be because of all the energy that's going to be in there. The more orbitals in a sublevel, the higher in energy that sublevel is going to be because there's lots of electrons in there. There's lots of energy. We already know this because we already know that 3D, the sublevel called 3D, the classroom called 3D, that's got five orbitals in it, and it's way high off the ground. It's so high off the ground that it actually is higher up than the 4s sublevel, which only has one atomic orbital in it, which is a little bit lower. Yes, it's on the fourth floor, but it's lower in energy than the one with five orbitals in it from the previous floor. Now, just to summarize, we saw a table like this in the last video that we have, instead of now the type of classroom, we have the type of sublevel. If it's an s sublevel, there's one atomic orbital in there. There are two electrons maximum. If it's a p sublevel, there are three atomic orbitals in there six electrons maximum. If it's a d sublevel, there are five atomic orbitals in there, 10 electrons maximum. And if it's an f sublevel, there are seven atomic orbitals in there, 14 electrons maximum. Now, remember that if you have more than one atomic orbital in a sublevel, the energies of those orbitals are exactly the same. They're identical in energy. They're not the same in position, or really in kind of how they look, but their position's a little different but they're identical in energy. And the word that we use for that is degenerate. So when you hear the word degenerate, that means that uh, we're talking about things of identical energy. Okay. The rules we had. Now we're changing, we're going to change the wording of the rules slightly, and we're going to actually give them names, but you already know these rules. The first rule is called the Aufbau principle, which says that electrons fill sublevels from lowest energy to highest. You can't put electrons into new sublevels until the previous sublevel is full. Well, that was our first rule for coming to school in the morning. A lot of students had to go into the lowest classroom first. They couldn't go to the next highest classroom until that one was full. And they had to go in order of height off the ground. Well, this is the same thing. When we talk about energy, lowest energy to highest energy, we mean closest to the nucleus, furthest away from the nucleus. The second rule is the Pauli exclusion principle. And this one says that no more than two electrons can occupy the same atomic orbital. And if there are two electrons in the same orbital, they must have opposite spins. This is our desk rule. No more than two students at a desk. But if there are two students at a desk, they have to face in opposite directions. That's what that means. We'll talk about spin in just a second. It's not a huge deal. And then our final rule is called Hund's rule. This was when filling a degenerate set of atomic orbitals, place one electron in each orbital before pairing them up. Remember, multiple desks in a room, students come into the room, they have to sit by themselves first before they can pair up. That's Hund's rule. It applies to electrons and orbitals as well. So the question then that you're kind of struggle with here is, do I have to draw this diagram every single time to get the order of sublevels? And the answer is no. Uh, the first thing is a diagram that we can use. And if you set up this uh, this diagram like this, you write uh, all the s's, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 s in a column, and then right next to it write 2p, 3p, 4p, 5p, 6p, and 7p. And remember, there's no 1p, so we don't have anything in that row. And then we have a column of d's starting at 3, and a column of f's starting at 4. 
and then we're going to draw some diagonal arrows through this. So we draw a diagonal arrow through 1s, and then another diagonal through 2s, and then the third diagonal goes through those, and we add these diagonal arrows. Now, you do have to remember kind of which ones the diagonal arrows go through, but if you do this, you now have a way of reading the order of sublevels. You start at the top and you follow, you proceed in the direction of the arrow. So we start with the first one, 1s, and then we go through 2s, and then on the third one, third arrow we go through 2p and then 3s, and then we go through 3p and then we go through 4s. Notice 3d is on the next row, it comes after that, so that takes care of our crossover. So you can use this diagram to figure out the order of sublevels. Um, you do have to remember how to draw the diagram, but it's not that difficult to do. A little bit later on, I'm going to show you an easier way that doesn't require any kind of drawing anything. You can actually get the order of sublevels off the periodic table if you know how to read it right, but we'll do that later on. So let's talk about iron. We're going to write the electron configuration for iron. All right, well, first thing we need to know is how many electrons iron has, so it has 26 electrons. Now, if we're going to fill those electrons, we need to remember that we're going to start at the lowest energy sublevel, and we're going to fill that first, and then we're going to move our way up in energy, so that means we need to know the order of sublevels, so we'll use our little diagram. 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, and so on. Okay, We've got to fill 26 electrons, so obviously room 1s is full. All room 1s can have, or sublevel 1s, it's got one atomic, atomic orbital in there, and one atomic orbital can fit a maximum of two electrons, and then we're done. The next two electrons go into 2s, and the next six go into 2p. So right there, we've got a total of 10 electrons through the second energy level. Now we go up to 3s, we put two in there. We go up to 3p, we put six in there. So now we're at 18. We're getting close, but not there yet. Now, after 3p, if you look back down at the diagram, the next one is 4s, and we can fill that with two electrons. And then finally, that's 20, we need six more, while well, the next one after 4s is 3d, and 3d can hold a maximum of 10. We don't have 10 electrons, so we'll just put the remaining six electrons that we do have in 3d6. Now, I don't read this 1s squared, 2s squared. I don't, these aren't exponents. These are numbers of electrons in that particular sublevel. So the way I read this from left to right is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d6. That's the electron configuration of iron. That gives me a lot of information. The only piece of information it doesn't give me is how the electrons might be arranged in, an, in a sublevel that's not full. And for that, I'm going to use something called an orbital filling diagram. Now, this is essentially the same thing as our little classroom diagram. The only difference is that I've drawn little squares to represent the desks. So each little square, the little bluish square, is a desk. And I'm using arrows to represent the electrons, or the students. Okay. Now, if you remember, if each little square is a desk, what it really means is each little square is an atomic orbital. And in any atomic orbital, the maximum number of electrons that can fit there is two. So in any square, you're going to see two arrows. And if there are two arrows in there, they have to be pointing in opposite directions. We draw an arrow going up and an arrow going down because electrons spin on an axis. They create a magnetic field, one of which goes up and the other one goes down, depending on how it's spinning. When two electrons are in the same orbital, they will spin in opposite directions. We call the up arrow spin up and the down arrow spin down. It's not very inventive, but that's how it's done. So any orbital that's full will have two arrows facing in opposite directions, up and down. All right. So all the way from the bottom, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, all three of those orbitals, all six electrons are paired up in orbitals. 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, and then we get to the last one, 3d6. We have six electrons to put into the 3d. So the first, the third rule there, Hunt's rule, says we have to put one in each. When they go into each orbital, they stay the same direction. Now, usually that's written by most chemists as the up arrow first. And then we put the last one in, the sixth one in, we pair up. And it doesn't really matter which one you put it in to pair with. It's just generally done from left to right, and so we pair it up with the first one there. So the electron configuration on the left and the orbital filling diagram on the right give us mostly the same information. The only piece of information the orbital filling diagram gives us that's maybe a little more useful is how the electrons are arranged in that or orbital, in that sublevel that's not full. And that'll be important when we talk about bonding. But for now, they give you about the same type of information. So you need to be able to do both of those 
um, create both uh, an electron configuration and an orbital filling diagram uh, for any element. All you need is the number of electrons and the diagram to give you the order of sublevels. And that's all there really is to it. So uh, give the video a look. Uh, if you need to pause, rewind, practice a little bit, pick an element and go ahead and do its electron configuration, draw its orbital filling diagram, and we'll continue on uh, next time.